Good afternoon. My name is David Thompson, and I'm the Director of Development for the Office of the Vice President for Research. Thank you for joining us today to learn about the, how the University of Michigan is generating new knowledge and advancing innovative solutions to reduce firearm injury, a public health crisis linked to more than 100 deaths per day across the United States. We have a number of University of Michigan researchers joining us here to explain the impact and importance of their work. And while we expect a number of great questions from our audience, we will do our best to answer as many as possible. But first, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Rebecca Cunningham, the William G. Barshan Collegiate Professor of Emergency Medicine and the Vice President for Research at the University of Michigan, where she is responsible for fostering the excellence and integrity of research and scholarship across all three University of Michigan campuses. Dr. Cunningham, a member of the National Academy of Medicine, has vast experience as a researcher, administrator, educator, and clinician, including more than 20 years as an emergency medical physician at the University of Michigan and in Flint, Michigan. Dr. Cunningham's career has focused on injury prevention, firearm injury prevention, and public health. Dr. Cunningham is here today to discuss the newly established Firearm Injury Prevention Research Initiative, which brings together University of Michigan researchers and key external stakeholders so that together they can formulate and answer critical questions about firearm injury prevention, all while respecting our Second Amendment rights. Dr. Cunningham, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, David. I would like to welcome all of you also who are joining us virtually to engage in this important dialogue. As an emergency physician, I have witnessed this public health crisis firsthand. And as a researcher who has studied firearm violence over the last 20 years, I'm confident that injury prevention science can reduce firearm injuries without limiting the number of firearms that we have in the country. At the University of Michigan, our vision is to serve research serve the world through research, which means utilizing our collective expertise and strong partnerships to address important challenges. As you will hear today, U of M has been a national leader in this space as it relates to research and scholarship involving firearm injury prevention. In fact, President Schlissel has identified firearm injury prevention research as a key university priority and recently launched a presidential initiative to address this public health crisis. I am pleased now to introduce President Schlissel whose ongoing support and leadership can truly spark positive impact in this space. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much, uh, Vice President Cunningham for the kind introduction. Uh, we're very fortunate as a university to have such breadth and depth amongst our faculty in firearm injury research. And that includes, of course, Dr. Cunningham herself. Ours is a university created to serve society and to improve the lives of people in all communities through research, education, and service. Faculty and students at U of M choose to work and study here precisely because we tackle society's biggest problems and because they know that we have a powerful Michigan family who support their work and who share their goal of a better, safer, and healthier world. The United States is unquestionably facing a public health crisis as it relates to firearm violence. And while federal research support is growing, it's still minuscule compared to other leading causes of mortality, such as cancer and car crashes. Nevertheless, researchers have persevered. In fact, as Dr. Cunningham will note, U of M has secured more federal funding for firearm injury research than any other US university. We need more work to be supported. Nearly 40,000 people died last year from gun-related injuries across the United States. Firearms are the number one cause of death amongst high school age students. Because of research, we know that firearm injuries are not a problem isolated to any single community. Children and adolescents from urban and rural areas are equally affected by this public health crisis. In fact, here in Michigan, more people die as a result of firearm injuries than from opioids. We also know that COVID-19 has increased mental health challenges in our society with feelings of isolation and depression exacerbated by the pandemic. 
And as we see in public health crises, the centuries long affliction of systemic racism has produced tragic inequities. Firearms are the number one cause of death for young black men. Rates for firearm injuries for black children and teens are more than three and a half times higher than those among white children and teens. We too often hear the phrase unspeakable tragedies when hearing about Americans killed by gun violence or suicide. But I believe that U of M research will speak loudly to the people of our nation by generating knowledge and examining data-driven solutions. Through U of M research, I believe we can bring clarity that hasn't been possible before. I'm proud that so many of our researchers have already answered this call. A year and a half ago, we were proud to launch a campus-wide firearm injury prevention research initiative to develop new knowledge and data on firearm violence, to save lives, to solve this crisis. It begins with providing the right opportunities. Our vision with this initiative is not to delve into Second Amendment politics, but rather to address injuries and death due to firearms as the public health crisis that it is. When Dr. Cunningham told me that so many of you had expressed interest in attending our event today, I realize why I'm an optimist. It's the scientist in me. I believe that there are answers, even to the most complex problems, just waiting to be discovered. The truth cannot hide from a Wolverine forever. Thank you for the commitment to addressing this crisis. Thank you for supporting the hope that our researchers can provide to millions in communities all across our nation. Thank you for helping us to add to the science and data we are now marshalling to save lives and prevent harm. I'd like to turn it back over to Vice President Cunningham. Thank you, Dr. Schlissel, for that warm welcome and for your support on this topic. So I'd like to start uh, now, uh, if you can show my slides. Thank you, and, and uh, bring us to some common understanding of how the University of Michigan is approaching this problem and a little bit of background uh, on the topic as a whole. And then I will turn it over to uh, a number of researchers who we have doing really interesting specific projects so that you can hear a little bit more about those. Um, next slide, please. But as I start first, I want us to all understand together what it is when I say that we're talking about firearm injury prevention, what kind of firearm injury prevention. We all have our own ideas about what this means. Here at the University of Michigan, we're really approaching this across all kinds of firearm injury, from the kind of injuries that happen when young children find a gun or are cleaning it or are playing with it and shouldn't have found it and uh, injure themselves or a sibling to suicide by gun that happens increasingly commonly among our young adult population, but also among older Americans right now at an alarming rate, to peer violence, either between uh, friends who get into an argument, peers on the street, or between a dating couple or intimate partners uh, who escalate to deadly firearm violence, and also to the really tragic uh, events of school shootings, as the one on the top right here that we've seen increasingly common across the country over the past couple of years and mass shootings in our public spaces to those that happened in Las Vegas. By the type of firearm injury prevention that we're looking to address here at the University of Michigan is, is all of these things. Next slide, please. As we mentioned in the introduction, my perspective on this topic is born out of my um, role as an emergency physician taking care of patients here in the trauma bay, uh, often with firearm injury here in Flint, Michigan over the last 20 years. But we all bring a perspective to this topic. We bring a political perspective. We bring a perspective as a parent, as a grandparent, as a teacher, as law enforcement, as gun owners. We all have these perspectives. Together, we need to have, bring all of those perspectives together. And at Michigan, we're committed to doing so to find uh, a solution here and a path forward. And I'll ask you as we go through this presentation and, and conversations on it, that regardless of what your perspective may be on this, that we keep collectively in mind our common goal here, which is to decrease injury and death by firearms. And it's one, as I've talked to people, hundreds of people across the country on this topic that we can all agree on. Next slide, please. 
I want us to start with our history. And we learn so much when we remember the history of where we've been and helps us guide forward. Uh, we face similar problems to the problem of, to the crisis of firearm injury before in our country. In the 1960s, we had unspeakable amount of deaths on car crash on our roads in the country. Ralph Nader wrote a book, Unsafe at Any Speed in the 1960s. Uh, we, we had tremendous carnage on the road. Far more deaths now than we have even by firearm injury. And our nation rose to that challenge our administrators and our government created the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. The CDC created the National Center for Injury Center, uh, Center and Control, Injury and Control. The, uh, it, that sparked forth the science of injury prevention that led us to decrease deaths. It led to a 50, to a 76% decline in motor vehicle crash deaths between the 1960s and 2017. The kind of crash pictured here doesn't happen so much anymore because we don't allow cars and pillars to be in that, that close on the road. We've redesigned roads. We've designed cars so that their front car crash doesn't impact in that, in that way. We've redesigned and rethought human behavior and how we get people to drink less before they drive and have that be less socially acceptable. All of these pieces came together for us uh, in getting to this place we are today with less car crash deaths. Next slide, please. The University of Michigan also took this challenge in the 1960s with our nation very much to heart. And we created the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute, UMTRI. Many of you on, on campus ha have seen this. Uh, this uh, institute focused on car safety. It focused on uh, both the technical aspects uh, and engineering as well as human behavior and uh, really helped uh, propel and lead the nation's uh, research on this topic. And for those of us that choose to remember a, a, a rosy time where this happened easily, I'll, I'll remind us all that car manufacturers at the time resisted dramatically the idea that we would have uh, increased safety in our cars, that were worried that consumers wouldn't pay for it, that people wouldn't want it. Um, now I can't walk into an auto dealer without being told how safe uh, the car is for the children that I have in them. We've really shifted over time and that took a lot of energy and Michigan was on the forefront of leading that research and energy. Next slide, please. The research does drive solutions and those solutions have real impact for people. This slide shows this blue line here shows from the mid 1990s, how many people died by car crash, that blue line and how much improvements we made with it over the subsequent years. And actually before the 90s into the 60s, it was actually way higher even than that on the left. And with that tremendous focus, that governmental focus, that research focus, the academic focus, we made tremendous strides. What we didn't make any strides on were uh, the red line here, which was firearm injury. And from the, the 1990s and before, we see that there was a steady amount of deaths in this and that those deaths have indeed rose over the recent years. And in fact, if we look what those, those lines collide in 2016 and 17, and we now have more people dying every year uh, by firearms than we do by motor vehicle crash. Next slide, please. We know also that this has been a tremendous impact on our children and teens uh, who have nothing to do with our, our politics or our, our rights on firearms. They're a very vulnerable population. And I point out this slide because the top three lines is a little hard to read, but the top three lines here are the first, second, and third causes of death for kids who live through infancy in our country. That blue line, the top part is car crash. Car crash has been the leading cause of death for children in our country uh, for decades, as, as we talked about, and it, it remains so now. The third line there, that gray line is cancer, labeled here technically malignant neoplasm. Cancer is the third leading cause of death for children in our country. The line that we haven't talked nearly enough about in our country to be able to make a difference is that orange line, which is the second leading cause of death for children in our country who live through infancy has been firearms for decades now. And in fact, you see that line increasing in recent years, that sharp tick up. And now we have as of 2017 that firearms indeed are the leading cause of death for high school age children in our country. Um, the, the children who we, we aim to protect as a country, we think we can do better. Next slide, please. 
This side, I, I want to uh, think about in terms, first of all, for those of you who love the state of Michigan like I do, and of course, as a public university, we are charged with serving both the state and the country, is that firearm deaths are a problem in all of our communities. Um, if you look across uh, this chart here, we see the darker the red, the more uh, gun injury death per population in that county. And we see that those dark red patches uh, and darker orange are all across our state. In rural communities, it tends to be more by suicide. In, in our urban communities, it tends to be more go gun homicide, but nonetheless uh, is an, a high cause of death across many of our communities. This is in all of our neighborhoods. We also point out here that over the last decade, many of you have heard many news articles and, and much talk about what we need to do about the opioid crisis, both in our state and the country, and Michigan is not different than the country here. Um, but what we should know also is that we haven't talked enough about the fact that guns have killed more people in Michigan than opioids have in the last decade. We haven't spent very much time talking about that. And that's one of the reasons we're doing uh, this event today, as well as uh, invigorating this initiative uh, on the topic. Next slide, please. This lack of uh, 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 discussion and conversation on the, on the topic has, uh, has led us to this place where um, uh, we have, have not been able to make sufficient progress. Starting in the late 1990s, when there was really almost a silencing of an entire generation um, of researchers and data and funding on this topic, that led to a cascading series of events, which led by 2010, we had almost no researchers uh, in, left in the country who were working on this topic because of the uh, lack of federal funding coming down on it. Um, for the entire country, even though I showed you it was the second leading cause of death by 2010, we were only dedicating as a country $135,000 a year to the entire country to focus on this topic. By 2017, when, car, when firearms surpassed car crash as the leading cause of death, there were hardly enough researchers around left in the country or academics to, to have a conversation on it to bring it to light to the public. When we think about this part on the right here, which are the um, how much funding we've actually allocated uh, to the country, I raise this now because as, as Dr. Schlissel said, this is a complex problem, but it is not a more complex problem than motor vehicle crashes or cancer is. It's not a problem that is too difficult to solve. It's a problem that as a country before this, we've decided we've simply not going to put that much effort towards solving. And, here uh, at the University of Michigan and across the country, there is an awakening now that we can really do more. Um, before, uh, over the past um, uh, decades uh, per year, we've focused on cancer, on childhood cancer. We fund that an average of $335 million a year to address children dying by cancer for the year, to make those tremendous gains in motor vehicle crash that we've uh, that I showed you in those blue lines, we fund an average of $88 million uh, a year. But for firearm injuries as a country, we just, we haven't put very much funding to it before, uh, only that $1 million. Next slide, please. This is a tremendous opportunity for U of M and why we come to you today. And, and we'll spend some time now showing you some of the great work that the university is doing. Next slide, please. I'm gonna introduce faculty in a moment here from schools all across uh, the university. Schools and uh, perspectives, uh, this diversity of perspectives will be uh, how we find our path forward. And we have so many faculty interested and in looking to work on this topic now. Next slide, please. So with that, um, I want to uh, introduce to you um, our faculty lineup for today. Um, six extremely talented and innovative researchers from across the University of Michigan who are utilizing their passion, dedication, and expertise to address the issue of firearm violence through research and scholarship. First up, we have Dr. Cynthia Ewell Foster, a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at Michigan Medicine. Dr. Foster, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham, and hello, everyone. I'm just delighted to be with you today. My name is Cindy Ewell Foster. I'm a child clinical psychologist by training, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Psychiatry here at U of M. Over the last 15 years, I've worked really closely with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to disseminate and evaluate best practice suicide prevention strategies in Michigan communities. 
And our work in Michigan's Upper Peninsula led to our focus on firearm safe storage as a really critical suicide prevention strategy. So I'd like to talk to you about that today. Next slide, please. So suicide is the second leading cause of death in youth and young adults in the United States. And this graph that you see here, which depicts all suicides that occurred in the US in 2018 across all ages and genders, shows that a majority of those suicide deaths are completed with a firearm. Among adult men, this percentage is even higher and the rates can go up from 55 to 77%. Clinically, one of our most powerful suicide prevention strategies is called counseling on access to lethal means. And we know that if someone attempts suicide with a firearm, there's an 80 to 90% chance of death. Studies show that making it difficult for people to access a lethal weapon at the time that a suicide crisis hits um, has, can have great impact and increase the chances um, of survival. The idea that if someone really wants to kill themselves, they will, is just not borne out by the data. So disseminating this clinical practice across Michigan is a really important focus of um, several of our implementation grants funded by, the, by SAMHSA and the CDC. Next slide, please. I'm going to switch gears and talk about our rural communities. So we know um, that in rural communities, suicide rates are higher and that the suicides that occur there are more likely to involve firearms. So using um, community engaged research methods in collaboration with our partners in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, we've been developing a universal prevention strategy with a goal of improving safe firearm storage in families with children who live in rural communities. And we're really grateful to Dr. Cunningham for having been a pilot project um, of the FACTS Consortium. So we think this intervention um, can have real benefit as a suicide prevention strategy. We know that when young people die by suicide, they are often using a family member's gun. And we also know that safe storage can have impact on both unintentional and intentional injuries with firearms. So how did we do this? Um, we pulled together a community advisory board. We ran focus groups in the community and key informant interviews. These folks were amazing and really shared such important information about how to do this. So some critical themes. Firearms are really a way of life in rural communities. There was such pride in being a responsible gun owner and lots of conversation about the way that safety is passed down through the generations and families during um, firearm related activities like hunting. Um, next slide, please. It was really important to us to honor what we heard from the community. And so what I'm showing you here is a preview of our multi-component online intervention. You can see that it really reflects the community. It's got Hunter's Orange and Woodland Scenes. Um, our, our focus groups told us that the most credible messengers in their community to talk about firearm safety were families and folks who worked with guns. And so you can see in this excerpt from our video, um, that's who we featured talking about this. We also have a hunter safety instructor talking about how to use different firearm safety strategies and what you might pick um, for your family. Other parts of the intervention include an infographic, which you'll see on the next slide, and a home safety checklist and action plan that families could go through. Next slide, please. So over the summer, we pilot tested this intervention with 45 families in the UP, and this is hot off the presses, but we're really excited about it. Um, at this stage of the research process, what we really want to know is if the intervention was acceptable to families, was it feasible to pull off, and did it have any impact? Um, we actually had 100% engagement with the intervention from families, so everybody went through it. 88% of our participants talked to the other adult in their home about the content. 85% completed that checklist and 40% reported making an improvement or a positive change in how they were storing their firearms. So we were really excited about that. Um, our next steps are seeking grant funding to test this in a larger community of folks, with more participants, and to really be sure that we are improving the intervention based on the feedback that we heard from families. So I just want to thank Dr. Cunningham and um, everyone here today. Thank you for the opportunity to share this work with you. Um, we're really excited about its potential and I'd like to hand things back to Dr. Cunningham now. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Next up, we have Dr. Patrick uh, Carter. 
an associate professor of emergency medicine and an associate professor of health behavior and health education. Dr. Carter, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Cunningham. Um, I'm Pat Carter. Uh, I'm from the Department of Emergency Medicine here at University of Michigan. Can we uh, advance to the next slide? Uh, as an emergency physician, uh, I really come to this, this um, problem uh, by, by really looking at how can we prevent youth from ending up in the emergency department with uh, firearm injuries. And among a youth population, the majority of firearm injuries are the result of interpersonal violence. And so uh, a venue for the work that uh, I've done has really been uh, working for the past 15 years or so in Flint and increasingly in recent years in Detroit around what types of interventions can we do with youth in the emergency department that will prevent them from ending up in the trauma bay with a violent firearm injury. And uh, primarily the, uh, the focus of this work has been around the types of counseling interventions that we can do in a preventative focus uh, when we engage with youth in the emergency department, when they're there for any reason, abdominal pain, a sore throat, or their initial violent injury, and how can we prevent them from suffering more severe injuries or engaging in risky behaviors with firearms uh, subsequent to that. And so, uh, so I'm going to talk about an exemplar intervention. Uh, can we advance to the next slide? Um, uh, that we're doing uh, currently in Flint, Michigan. And I'll say that the majority of this work really is one-on-one -on -one interpersonal um, uh, counseling with youth who are at risk and are in the emergency department. But there's also a, a scientific question and, and a lot of this work has engaged with how can we utilize technology both in the emergency department, but also with youth after they leave the emergency department to extend the effects of those interventions and to really kind of boost the effects of them uh, in ways that youth are engaging every day uh, uh, on their own with technology. So for example, text messaging or smartphone apps or the use of uh, electronic robots to engage with youth and provide intervention content in addition to the counseling that really the cumulative effect of that is to decrease uh, violence outcomes. Can you go to the next slide, please? So I'm gonna talk about one intervention that we're currently doing uh, in Flint, Michigan, and that's Project Interact. And in this study, we are engaging with youth who come into the emergency department uh, and tell us that they carry firearms on a regular basis. And we provide counseling uh, that starts in the emergency department during their visit, actually one-on-one -on -one with a counselor, either in person or via telehealth model, and then continues with them after they leave the emergency department that day and provides them with two additional counseling sessions. And those counseling sessions really are focused around identifying what their goals are in life and positive behaviors that they can help take to reach those goals, as well as providing them with skills to navigate tricky and difficult situations they may find themselves in, in nonviolent ways, um, uh, in, in avoiding uh, risky firearm behaviors. And then in addition to that, we um, have put a, a smartphone app on their, on their, on their phones and that app is able to deliver additional therapeutic content and messaging in between these therapy sessions with, with a health coach. And can we go to the next slide? And here's an example of some of the types of content that we deliver um, via the smartphone app. And it's really focused around positive messages that can help them achieve their goals. It's focused around providing skills and tips uh, for navigating difficult situations such as anger management or nonviolent conflict resolution or decreasing risky or firearm behaviors. And these messaging is all personalized to the individual youth and uh, helps them to really navigate the situations that they're experiencing in their lives. And uh, we also provide through the smartphone app uh, access to local community resources um, that can help them to achieve their goals and, and uh, navigate situations. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, you know, we're actively testing this intervention currently and enrolling youth in the, in the program, but uh, we pilot all of these interventions with, um, with youth in the community. We get their feedback on them and uh, we enhance them and make them better based on what, what resonates with, with the youth that we're, that we're engaging in these, um, in these studies. And so I think it's important to acknowledge some of the feedback that youth have given us about this. They really enjoy engaging with the counselors. They really enjoy getting personalized messages that are really crafted to be specific to their needs and having the ability to tell their story about their experiences and, and the things that they need in order to positively develop. And so uh, I'll leave it there and turn it back to Dr. Cunningham, but I'm happy to answer more questions uh, at the question and answer portion. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Next up, we have Dr. Justin Heinze, an assistant professor of health behavior and health education. Dr. Heinze, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham, and thanks for those on the call for being here. Uh, they've asked me to come here today and talk to you about schools. 
And I, I had my reservations at first because when we think about youth firearm injury, schools are often misunderstood. They get this bad rap as very dangerous places when they're actually one of the safest places for our young people to be. But the sad reality is that horrific events like those in Parkland or Santa Fe High School or Sandy Hook Elementary are so salient that they've not only changed the way that we think of schools as safe spaces, but they've also been the impetus behind a whole range of interventions from metal detectors to automatic blinds to lockdown drills and even arming teachers in efforts to ensure that a school shooting will never happen again. And as laudable as those intentions are, I came today because I am very concerned that we are using policies and procedures that have little to no evidence that they are effective at preventing shootings. And in fact, they may be harmful to the students they're trying to protect. Next slide, please. As just one example, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about lockdown drills, also called active shooter drills. Now lockdown drills are very popular. Up to about 95% of, of schools participate in some form of active shooter training. And they can range from something relatively simple on one end, like through an announcement, uh, teachers will lock doors and turn off lights and maybe move students into a hard corner where you can't see them from the hallway. But on the other end, you'll have actors banging on doors or even simulating live gunfire to see how students and staff respond in a crisis. And these can create fear, stress, anxiety, and even trauma for the participants. I got interested in active shooter drills a few years ago while having a conversation with a principal in a school about seven miles away from Sandy Hook Elementary. And when I asked about how things had changed since the shooting, a comment from Principal Thomas you see here that really struck me was the amount of time and energy they were diverting away from their educational mission and putting into drills. Or in her words, they were learning how to hide. All of this for something we aren't even sure is working. Next slide, please. So what do you do in the face of a problem that has little to no evidence available? Well, our approach is to start generating that evidence. And then I'm gonna speak about a few ways that we're doing that. The first is to try to understand more about drills themselves. The data that you see here are from about 2000 students across the country. And we asked them about this, their school's active shooter drills and whether they found them stressful. And you can see it's kind of a mixed bag, but as many as a third of those students did say that they were stressful. Next slide, please. Now let's contrast that with the parents of those same students who are overwhelmingly in favor of having these drills. And my concern here is that you have this key stakeholder who's supporting these activities when they could be psychologically harmful to their students. Next slide, please. But we didn't wanna stop there. And so in another study, we probed a little bit deeper with these, these ideas of lockdown drills. And we asked about 1,100 students whether they found their drills scary, um, do they make their schools feel safer, and do te uh, teachers and students treat these drills seriously? What we found was that for a, a lot of students, these lockdown drills actually did help them make their school feel safer. But for those who found them scary, the drills not only made their schools feel less safe, but they could also increase their depression and their anxiety. And so we're arguing that you need to consider both the form and function of lockdown drills. We think that students recognize the function of drills and that they are, they're a signal of a school's preparedness in response to a crisis. But we also think that students respond to the form of the drills, especially if they're scary or imposing. And that can uh, be what leads to those negative ramifications. Next slide, please. And so with so little data about drills available, and since the data we do have doesn't provide clear best practices, our second approach is to test other efforts to prevent school shootings without the associated trauma. So one strategy we're actively testing is, is the use of anonymous or confidential reporting systems. More than half of the states in the US mandate some form of reporting system, the goal of which is to create avenues for students to speak up if they think someone is in a danger to themselves or others. These systems arose after previous work showed that in many cases, school shooters told someone of their plan before perpetrating the event. The idea is by creating awareness and encouraging reporting, there's a possibility of averting serious violence. Next slide, please. And we're also looking further upstream. So using a combination of evidence-based approaches focused on securing the physical environment, recognizing mental distress in students, and promoting fairness in disputes and disciplinary practices, we think we can improve school climate, which we know in turn should promote better student mental health, both of which together can prevent violence in schools. And that's not just active shooter violence, but that could mean interpersonal violence and bullying, intimate partner violence, and even self-directed violence, all of which become more lethal when a firearm is involved. 
Next slide, please. And I'll just close with a big thank you to our partners in these efforts and to thank you for your time today. Go Blue. Thank you, Dr. Heinze. When you bring up here, you know, how much we don't know about shooter drills and how much we don't know about what the ways are to keep our students safe, it, it reminds me why we need to answer these questions and what research is. It's finding out the answers of what the best practices are and whether things work or whether they don't work and what the impacts of them are. So thank you so much. Next up is Dr. Rosario Ceballo, the Associate Dean for Social Sciences at the College of Literature, Science and Arts. Dr. Sabajo is a professor of psychology and a professor of women's and gender studies. Dr. Sabajo, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. Um, can people see me? Oops. Hello? Um, I can't tell if people can see me or not. Oh. Hello. Okay, I, I got a message that people can see me. So I am going to go ahead and start. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. It's an honor to be a part of this distinguished panel today and to be with all of you today. I'd like to do two things um, with my precious five minutes today. Uh, next slide, please. The first is that I would like to um, share briefly how my own research on children's exposure to community violence connects with firearm injury prevention research. And the second, since I serve as Associate Dean for the College of LSA, I'd like to share the enormous enthusiasm in the college for this new initiative. So first, a quick snapshot of my research. I study children and adolescents' experiences with community violence. And we know that many children and adolescents are subjected to incredibly high rates of violence in poor urban neighborhoods on a sometimes daily chronic basis. These include incidents like being mugged, being chased by gangs, or seeing a dead body on the way to school. High rates of violence exposure have been documented even among very young elementary school age children. Um, when I first started doing research in Detroit, we asked fifth graders to make drawings of both the good and the bad things in their neighborhoods. Now, why good and bad? Because it's never all bad. And the drawings of the good things included what you would expect, drawings of flowers, trees, schools, pets, et cetera. I'd like to share two drawings of the bad things in neighborhoods. So in this first picture, next slide please, you can see that this fifth grader drew um, a picture of a knife, littering and dogs. And the dogs here represent the presence of stray, often dangerous dogs. And then of course you can also see the very prominent gun. In the second picture, in the next slide, a student drew a picture of their house and wrote, quote, I hate everything, underlined for emphasis, but not my house or my backyard. And I thought when I saw this picture, thank goodness that this child feels safe and protected in their home, even as they hate everything outside and around their house. Perhaps not surprisingly, the highest rates of community violence exposure are reported among poor racial ethnic minority youth and guns are often involved in the most severe incidents. Next slide, please. In one of my recent studies with 416 Latino adolescents in Chicago and Detroit, um, these are reports of just gun-related incidents. 78% of the high schoolers reported hearing gunfire outside when in or near their homes on a frequent basis over the past year. 21% reported seeing someone else shot with a gun and 10% reported being shot at, but not wounded with a gun in the past year. So despite experiencing what is often chronic and random violence, not all children living in the same neighborhood are exposed to similarly high rates of violence. And not all youth who are exposed to violence experience the same heightened levels of negative psychological symptoms like depression and PTSD. My students and I are interested in conducting research from a resilience or strength-based perspective in order to answer questions like, what are the factors that protect youth from experiencing violence in the first place? And what are the factors that protect youth from the negative effects of violence once they've been exposed to violence? So to give you a quick example, in one study, we found that greater after-school participation in non-school organized sports and non-school clubs 
was associated with greater exposure to community violence. Non-school sports and clubs may not provide adequate adult supervision and may instead increase time spent hanging out with peers in dangerous neighborhood settings where violence is more likely to happen. Our findings counter the current wisdom that participation in any activity is always positive. Knowing that firearm injuries and fatalities, excluding suicides, are disproportionately sustained by African-American and other racial ethnic minority groups means that in my opinion, it's imperative that we attend to socioeconomic factors like urban poverty and systemic racism when studying the factors that place children at risk or protect children from firearm injuries. Pivoting to the second thing that I said I would do with my time. Next slide, please. It was my pleasure to share this initiative with faculty in the College of LSA, the largest of U of M's 19 schools and colleges. Faculty interest and enthusiasm across the college was tremendous. The faculty who expressed a desire to be involved represented a number of different departments. And as you can see from this slide, they include, they include faculty from the departments of communication and media, English, physics, political science, psychology, and sociology. And an incredible range of expertise and depth of knowledge is represented in these faculty who are engaged in research topics such as racial inequality and the history of policing, the racial politics of police violence and police killings, and interventions to reduce crime among disadvantaged youth. In closing, I will say that I think nothing can predict the success of an academic initiative better than widespread diverse faculty enthusiasm and engagement as seen among the LSA faculty that I represent. And now I'd like to pass things back over to Dr. Cunningham. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sabazo. Next up is Dr. Jane Prophet, a professor of art and design and associate dean for research, creative practice and strategic initiatives at the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design. Dr. Prophet, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. It's great to be here, uh, part of this larger group. Um, I'm going to talk about the perspective um, of Stamp School of Art and Design, which has a community of faculty and students who work across both art and design. We have a particular strength in community engaged projects. And we also have a number of um, people doing research uh, around health and well-being. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide, which is all text, is really where we started when I was uh, became part of this larger group. I wanted to better understand with my um, colleagues how stamps might might work around the issue of firearm injury prevention, which was a, a fairly new topic for us. We knew we were bringing uh, to the party our approach with mixed methods and our commitment to collaborative working. And we started by asking questions like, how might teams that include community participants, artists and designers, think differently about um, how to prevent firearm injury? Prevent, uh, firearm injury? For example, might we redesign safer neighborhoods and include more art in those designs? Could we use creative projects to raise awareness? We were also uh, familiar with the power of events that we co-create and the artworks that are co-produced and how they can impact communities and particularly how they can help communities heal who are, who are experiencing um, firearm injury. We then decided that what we needed to do is to better understand what was happening across the US in art and design as a whole around these topics. And I worked with our undergraduate student, Leah New, to conduct a literature review in effect, a review of the art to see uh, what was happening. Next slide, please. We broadly decided that having done that review, there were sort of four categories um, of work. And on this image, you see a very colorful wall, a grid image, every square on the grid is an origami box. It's called the Soul Project. And it's a way that people come together to share stories and pay homage really to a person that they may have lost or, or somebody who may have passed away or been injured through um, firearms. Now, social engaged projects, this category, 
these are artworks or designs that have a function that goes beyond aesthetic pleasure. They're not just about how beautiful they may look. They're responding to a social issue, in this case, um, firearm injury. And the participants usually want to create change, to prompt conversation. And we find that with social engaged projects, participants in the community are very much involved in the production of the work, usually with a lead art or designer. Next slide, please. Another category that might be familiar to many of you is what we might call social commentary work. There's often less community engagement in the production of these artworks. Um, we're looking now at an image of very large buildings in an urban American city with huge statistical slogans projected onto those buildings, quite dramatic at night. Um, this artist, Jenny Holzer, is known for the way that she uses image and text. These projects are really using a kind of taking a rhetorical approach. They're wanting to inform, they're wanting to promote change, to, pro to provoke thought. And often there's a social justice component to these. Next slide, please. Here's rather a dramatic image. It's a building that's on fire. And this is under the category of collaborative projects, which I think also over intersects with some of those other, uh, other kinds of works I've already introduced to you. This project though, was not a building that caught fire accidentally. And it was not a building that was subject to arson. This was a ceremonial burn. It's called Temple of Time. And it was a way of bringing together members, a very diverse group of members of the community from first responders, hospital staff, people with special needs, families who had lost people after a mass shooting. And if we could go to the next slide, please. In this image, we're really able to now start to think about some of the gaps, if you like, in the knowledge. We expected to find in our review a lot of designed objects. And when Leah New started to search, she was surprised that we couldn't find that many design interventions. So if you think back to the very beginning of this talk, when we were um, introduced to the idea of design interventions with, um, in relation to car injuries, this gun that you see in the image cannot be fired unless the watch with it is within um, 10 inches. So there are some designs. Final slide, please. So what can we do? Currently, there's a lack of support for collaboration. Um, but when there is support, a huge amount of energy and works emerge. We think we could do a lot by working with interdisciplinary design teams. And we're starting to do that at University of Michigan with a group of, of faculty and students at STAMPS. We want to work with community participants. And in, we also would like to team social scientists with artists and designers. So we can actually gather data to find out just how impactful and effective those works that are already being undertaken in the community are. Thank you very much. I'd like to hand back now to Dr. Cunningham. Thank you, Dr. Profitt. Uh, the, the work and the, the conversations that you have um, uh, when we bring together the arts and design folks across uh, the rest of the disciplines have been so fascinating to listen to and to hear those perspectives come out. And it's through that diversity of thought that we'll find a path forward. Our final presenter is Dr. Mark Zimmerman, the Marshall Beckett Collegiate Professor of Public Health. Dr. Zimmerman is also a professor of health behavior, health education, as well as a professor of psychology. Dr. Zimmerman, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. Um, just wanna say a little bit about myself. I've been at the University of Michigan for uh, now in my 32nd year. <clears throat> I started uh, working in youth violence prevention in 1994 uh, with a, a longitudinal study of Flint youth where most of my work has uh, been you know, work going on. But, uh, my uh, colleagues and I have been working really around the country around these issues. We've worked in Youngstown, Ohio, and Camden, um, Miami, uh, LA, and, um, and, uh, and, and New Jersey. Uh, next slide, please. I um, want to tell you a little bit about uh, how our work kind of grew into this idea of busy streets theory. And I'll do it in juxtaposition to uh, broken windows theory, which many of you may be familiar with. Broken windows theory is the idea that one broken window 
leads to another broken window and leads to the downward spiral of a neighborhood into a crime and uh, uh, what sociologists call disorganization. Uh, and uh, and it, it sends a message that people don't really care about the neighborhood, that um, that's a place where maybe they can get away with things and all sorts of other nefarious activities may occur. So we came up with the idea, much like uh, the idea of resilience um, and looking at the positives. And we said, well, what happens if we build it? If we build it, will they come? So we started working with uh, some community partners up in Flint, um, the Genesee County Land Bank in particular. Uh, they have several programs that they work on, on uh, trying to overcome and uh, clean up and uh, improve vacant lots. So uh, the city of Flint has about 10,000 uh, lots, uh, parcels that are owned by the land bank. And they have different programs to take back those lots um, and to uh, rehabilitate uh, uh, crumbling buildings. So we said, what happens when you do clean it up? What happens if you put a community garden on there or a piece of artwork or create a pocket park or simply just mow it? Uh, and so we created this idea of busy streets theory. If you build it, they will come. And if you create a, a place that's sending a different kind of message of positive interaction, creating places for people to interact in positive ways, uh, creating the impression that people care about this place, um, what will happen? And I can tell you that we have uh, found pretty consistently that uh, whether you mow it or whether you uh, put a community garden on it, uh, people take care of their own properties. Uh, they feel better about where they live. They tell us uh, that they uh, are more in engaged with their neighbors. They trust their neighbors more. And importantly, we've also found that uh, there's drops in uh, violent crime and also uh, gun-related crime in those areas. So if I can have the next slide, just to give you a sense of what this looks like, uh, this is a before and after picture of a corner in, uh, in the city of Flint where uh, it's overgrown, garbage is thrown on it, uh, it's not cared for, uh, and it's certainly a place where you might not want to be, uh, certainly not a place where you uh, might want to walk your dog or um, walk your child. Uh, subsequent to the busy streets and greening activities, this lot was cleaned up, a, a fence was put up to show some kind of ownership, some kind of place basedness to it, uh, it's made more green and uh, uh, planted with grass and uh, trees. Uh, and what we found here is that crime in that area went down. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. Next slide, a little bit more subtle change, but uh, similarly uh, working with a neighborhood organization um, along the University Avenue corridor in Flint. This was an empty lot that uh, was clearly overgrown, had some uh, cement from an, a former building, uh, not a pleasant place to walk uh, before. And the community organization got together and they put up some pillars, uh, made a nicer path through the park, uh, the little mini park, they uh, planted grass. And you can imagine yourself actually stopping with your children and having a catch. And just think about those two places and what kind of message it sends to, um, both people in and outside of that community and whether or not you'd wanna live there. Uh, and I uh, just wanna also acknowledge that these uh, kinds of places uh, where there's lots, of, where there's high vacancy like Detroit and Camden and Youngstown, uh, Saginaw and other uh, industrial cities in the North that have seen a manufacturing and an economy going down, um, that uh, they, they don't accidentally happen in, in certain, uh, they happen in certain places, not others. If I can have the, uh, the last slide. We've also um, engaged youth in uh, youth leadership programs. This, here they are uh, painting the side of a strip mall and then they put up a, uh, a mural that they designed. Uh, we helped them identify a local mural artist. Um, and then they uh, painted this mural that's been up since for about over a decade now, it's not been graffitiized, and um, it still stands as an icon in uh, in Northern Flint. And that's from our program called Youth Empowerment Solutions. And I think I will end with that. And um, one one more slide, just to say thank you. And I'm delighted to be here, and um, and flattered that uh, I'm here with such uh, uh, my colleagues are so impressive. I, I'm just really 
I love being here at the University of Michigan. I go back to um, send it back to Dr. Cunningham. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. So I wanna thank all of our panelists today. I'm always so impressed by the important and impactful research that our faculty are taking the leading role in. I see some questions in the chat asking about, um, are there other schools engaged? Is the nursing school engaged or social work? Or, And I, I wanna assure you that we did not have time today to, to spotlight all of the research that's going on, but we have faculty across many schools, uh, separate from the faculty here who are engaged in this topic. and that the type of work that these faculty are presenting uh, here today is also being done in, in a very rigorous manner. And we're understanding um, with that, which parts are working, which parts are not in a really uh, uh, objective and non-biased way, which is, which is our goal. Um, so I wanna thank you all for your continued work in this critical space. I wanna open up, we have just time, I think for one or two questions, which I'm gonna pull out of the chat um, with our audience members uh, here before we end today. And then hopefully we'll go on to uh, be showing more of the great work from the University of Michigan on this topic going forward. So um, let's see, I have a question for the audience here. Dr. Heinze, there's been some, there's some questions around the um, active shooter drills, a couple different, asked a couple different ways in the chat, but one of the themes I see here is um, if these have to be used, what should principals know about these active shooter drills to make them as effective as possible and to minimize stress for, students and teachers? What can, what can you help our audience understand? Yeah, uh, it, it's a good question. And I want to say up front, I, I feel for principals. I, I mean, you saw what the parents said. Uh, they want these drills. In, in many districts and states, drills are mandated. And for the most part, principals have little to no guidance or blueprints for how to implement them. So I think for one, scare tactics don't work and probably cause more harm than help train students for the, for the real thing. What I do think is that drills need transparency. Students, staff, and parents need to know when these drills are happening. And you need to build in time after drills to decompress and debrief so that students understand why they are necessary. And I think we can borrow ideas from a trauma-informed uh, framework and coordinate with other bodies like law enforcement, social work, the medical community, um, to make them as effective as possible. But really, it comes down to also developing more evidence and so that we can ultimately provide a, a toolkit that would be available to any principal with resources and ideally technical support so that they can implement a drill that is as appropriate for their school community as possible. I think I have time for one more question before I hand it back to David. Um, I see a question here on uh, maybe for you, Dr. Carter. What is the role of external partnerships with companies uh, and businesses and communities? Wow, that's a big question. I think, um, you know, we've seen a lot of growth in this space in terms of uh, companies and foundations and their interest in addressing this topic. I think as it has affected both their employees as well as the communities in which they are, are active in, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's really become on the forefront of the issues they care about. And so I think that, that companies can find ways to partner with academic institutions like Michigan um, to address the topics that are most impactful in their communities and find solutions that are data-driven. And so I think we are obviously open and, and welcome to, to that effort. And I think, uh, and, and I think we, are, we can partner and, and find the solutions to the problem. Great, and I'm, I'm told we have time for a couple more questions. So, so that's good, because I see a lot of really interesting questions in the, in the chat here. Um, uh, one, uh, we will definitely have, a, uh, have the recording of this event for people available later. So uh, please do know that. So people will be able to share that and we'll send that out to you. Um, let's see, I have here, uh, Dr. Prophet. Uh, when we think of firearm injury prevention, art isn't the first thing that springs to mind. How do, how do you think, what do you think artists are gonna to bring to this challenge exactly? Well, I think that, that we need multiple different ways of um, gathering data. Um, that's probably something that we've heard across all the talks that uh, we need more data and different ways of actually connecting with communities. And I think that art is a, and design are, are really good ways of, of connecting. Um, and finding and uh, making space for people to tell their own stories, um, hearing from them about the kind of changes they think are needed, but also starting to do this important job of healing in communities uh, whilst we continue to live with the kind of gun um, violence and, and firearm injury that we will be doing, we'll be living that with that for a while. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see, Dr. Sabajo, uh, there's a question here from your drawings, which I found so interesting from the kids' perspective. Um, do you find gender differences when you look at girls versus boys uh, uh, pictures in the children's exposure to violence or the kinds of violence that youth are exposed to? What are you finding from your work? Um, thanks for that question. That's a great question. Um, we categorize exposure to violence into two different types. So witnessing violence and then being victimized by violence. And what we've often found is that boys and girls show no differences in witnessing violence. So in poor urban neighborhoods, equal opportunity, boys and girls witness same amounts, same types of violence, unfortunately. Uh, when we look at being um, victimized by violence, we find that boys tend to be, uh, tend to suffer more personal victim victimization. So thanks for the question. Yes, and a couple other questions I'm keeping up in the, the chat here. Um, there's a, a question on gun violence in the home and um, unfortunate case of an 18 month old being shot by a five year old. And I guess I will, I will take that in, in noting that um, this is uh, unfortunately happens about eight times a week in, in our country that a young child shoots another young child with a gun that is in their home. Um, and one of the ways that is being addressed broadly by the group is, is around the concept of safe storage. And you heard a little bit of that from Dr. Eul Foster here today. And there's other work on campus going on on that as well and how we can help our firearms that are in home not be as accessible to our young children. Um, let's see, uh, I also see a question here. Dr. Foster, this is for you. Um, uh, I'm especially interested in the discussion about it making it legal nationally for healthcare providers to question parents about the presence of guns in the home and how we how that conversation happens. Can, can you answer that question? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I'll first say it is legal for healthcare providers to ask parents that question. And, you know, in the suicide prevention community, we often say everybody has a role to play. And I think that's equally true around firearm safe storage. Everybody has a role to play. And so our suicide preven prevention community really um, encourages folks to ask those questions, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics and many other national healthcare organizations really recommend that. I would say that it's really important to be um, culturally sensitive in those conversations, to come at it with a um, a harm reduction approach and really listen to why people own the guns that they have and then work with them in a problem solving way to um, create a safer environment for those kids. Thank you so much. I, I have a question on the chat here on um, perhaps from the earlier slides on, you know, is the government or government not funding um, this type of work? And I do want people to understand that um, there, there is uh, government funding some, it's, it's not shut off the way it was in the 90s anymore. So both the NIH and the CDC and other agencies are beginning to slowly fund work on this topic. Although as we talked about, um, not at the rate of that we're funding car crash or, or cancer research in this country yet, it's still very small, but is coming along and it's not, not disallowed anymore, just in the same way that healthcare providers are not, not allowed to talk about this anymore, we are. Um, uh, so that is the way this, uh, this work is, is coming along and, uh, and perhaps there will be more government funding over, over these next years and foundations and community funding on this as well. Um, let's see, we have time for another couple of questions here. I see um, Dr. Carter, uh, here's a question for you. Um, is the University of Michigan initiative, is this gonna focus on reducing gun ownership? Do you wanna take that? Uh, sure, uh, I, I'd say the short answer to that is no. Um, right. I mean, I think we, we are focused on, as I think you heard Dr. Foster talk about and Dr. Zimmerman and Dr. Heinze and, and frankly, everybody on the call, uh, uh, as a, with a harm reduction and risk reduction approach. And I think the, um, the analogy to cars here is actually is really important. So if we think about cars in the 1950s um, and all the research that Dr. Cunningham talked about initially that we did to make cars safer and drivers safer, we did all of that despite the fact that today there are more cars on the road and more vehicle miles being driven by people every year. And we didn't do that by taking away cars or stopping people from driving. And so I think there are, there's definitely low hanging fruit here for how we make firearms safer, how we uh, change behavior around making uh, safe storage uh, more acceptable, 
how we uh, increase people doing safe storage, how we counsel around it. And I think all of that can be done focusing on data-driven solutions that don't involve anything around gun ownership or inhibiting the rights of gun ownership. Great, thank you. Um, I see a question here. Um, is there research at U of M focused on firearm violence and domestic abuse? Uh, and I guess I'll just answer that broadly and saying that um, we are focused on all the different kinds of firearm injury prevention on campus here. So from peer violence to domestic violence to as those unintentional injuries or school shootings. So all of that work is, is part of this initiative and it all makes up the tragic numbers that we see as a whole on, on firearm violence um, and, and injury that we see. Let's see, I'm reading through the chat here. Um, uh, let's see, one more question. Um, yes, let's see. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman, um, there's some questions on the type of vacant lots that, that you showed. You're really interesting work on how you change the built environment and that that makes a difference. It's something as simple as changing the lot makes a, a difference in, in the amount of firearm injury in, a, in an area. Um, so when you do that, how, how do you, so if you know that and you know that changing the lot makes a difference for vi firearm injury, how, how do you scale that? What do you do with that information that we can find helpful for our audience here? You're on mute, Mark. Yep. I realize that. Um, two quick answers. One is um, we've done some work in Detroit on demolition. So taking down buildings that are so far gone that they're just better off being uh, torn down. Uh, and those uh, are re also related to less uh, firearm violence as a result when, when they're made in basically into empty lots. Uh, there's also um, efforts to uh, board up buildings that are board upable uh, in more uh, appealing ways. So for example, instead of hammering up a, a, tube, I mean a uh, plywood on the outside of the, of the um, building, do it on, in, on the inside and then paint the, door, the window so that it looks like a window still. Uh, and so it just has that subtle difference. And uh, some colleagues who have actually tested that in Philadelphia have found that to be uh, effective. Well, I'll say that these are also very community engaged, community uh, linked and a very local kind of solutions. And they, they aren't all that expensive. I'm so impressed by the different types of solutions that we can have from all these different angles. So I wanna thank the panel again and uh, turn it back to my colleague, David. Thank you again to our faculty panelists for sharing your important work with us today. And thank you to all of you for engaging us virtually. We recognize this is time out of your day. We appreciate it and your interest. If you're interested in learning more about the firearm injury pre prevention research at the University of Michigan, please visit firearminjury.umich.edu. Thank you again and go blue.